So I'm just going to share a bit one slide. So as Gonzalo said, I'm Vincent Zoet from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics and the University of Lausanne. And I'm coordinating activity three of this community, which is about biomacromolecule ligand interactions. So in this uh, activity, we are, have a project which is to uh, develop a pipeline for uh, the automation of the creation of uh, benchmark sets for uh, different structure-based computer-ready drug design. We have many groups participating to that, so you are welcome to join if you'd like, just contact us. And before introducing um, Dr. May, I would like to uh, mention that actually we are preparing a spring school about structure-based computer-ready drug design in the context of uh, Elixir that is going to take place uh, this June between 10 and 14 uh, in Lausanne. So the Spring School will be divided into two sections. Uh, on Monday and Tuesday, we are going to introduce the experimental approaches that are used in order to uh, obtain the three-dimensional structures of ligand protein complexes, uh, how they, uh, the information is uh, collected, uh, annotated, disseminated, and also how far we can trust it and correct it. And in the second part of the week, we are going to use uh, uh, this information in order to uh, support uh, the uh, teaching about structure-based computer-ready drug design tools this time, uh, starting from the old, old uh, approaches based on physics and molecular interactions up to the uh, latest, deepest uh, deep learning approaches uh, in Friday. So if you are interested in this um, uh, Spring School, please just contact us or go to the uh, Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics website or Google it. You are going to find us uh, and be able to uh, register. So thank you very much for that. So uh, now I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Antonia May. So after uh, uh, first studies at the University of Kiel, Dr. May made a PhD at the University of Edinburgh. And after a postdoc uh, at the University of Berlin, she joined again the University of Edinburgh, where she's currently senior lecturer and chancellor's uh, fellow. So Dr. May specialized in machine learning, biomacromolecular modeling, statistical mechanics applied to protein dynamics and interactions with small molecules. And today she's going to talk about silver, Conditioning diffusion models for fragment based small molecule generation. So, thank you very much, Dr. May, and the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen again and hopefully. Yes, um, today I'm going to talk about um, Silver. Silver is a model uh, we developed in, in my group around fragment based drug discovery. And um, so, Really, this kind of grew out of um, a bit of curiosity based on my side and Nicholas Renshi. Nicholas Renshi is a master's student at the moment with AstraZeneca, but most of the work um, I'm presenting today, he did um, as a side project during his undergraduate. Uh, and he also kindly provided this uh, very cute, um, stable diffusion generated uh, molecule image based on diffusion models uh, can be used for molecule generation. So what we're going to talk about today are main, mainly three themes. So I'm going to introduce what fragment-based drug design is, just in case uh, people are unsure what, what that means, and make sure everyone's kind of on the same page with that. Um, then I'm going to introduce what a diffusion model is and how we can use diffusion models for generating molecules. And then I'm going to talk about how, in particular, we use it to condition a generative model um, with fragments and what we can do with that. Uh, and as I mentioned already, all of this work was done by Nicholas Brunchy. Um, Stephanie, someone to watch out for. He's going to start his PhD in Oxford in, in September, and I'm sure there'll be lots of cool things um, coming from him in the future. All right, so just to kind of set the scene, um, if we think about um, drug discovery, that is typically a fairly slow and long-winded process uh, where you start out with something like target identification all the way up to clinical trials uh, with many different steps in between involving lots and lots of different people, lots of different experts um, along, along the way. And um, I'm not a drug designer by, by trade. I'm, I'm a statistical physicist who happened to be interested in applying some of the, these methodologies 
to uh, computational methods uh, that can be used in, in drug design. In particular, we're mostly doing work around the sort of lead discovery and lead optimization in my group. So these are both machine learning based models and, and simulation based models. Um, so in that sense, we already know what is the protein we're interested in and in, in targeting. Most of the work we do is structure-based design, which means we do have a crystal structure of a protein. We often also have a um, ligand or a fragment structure available that will make things easier. But then if we now think of this pipeline, how do we actually end up with a lead compound or how do we optimize this, this lead compound? So we need to start with a search base somewhere. So Typically, what you might want to do is um, virtual screening. So you start with a very large library, for example. This could be, well, it could be a smaller library you have pre-curated. It could be something like an enum in real space. Um, and traditionally, you would run some kind of bioinformatics methods that allow you to kind of narrow down your, your search to, to thousands of compounds, and then you can see how, how well they work um, using computational methods such as docking or uh, free energy calculations um, until you hopefully find some kind of fit. So you, you have um, a compound that will actually bind to here, um, uh, a beta lactamase. Um, and this is kind of the, the ultimate goal to start with, identify a compound that binds with good efficacy to, to your protein. Obviously, you want to optimize other parameters such as toxicity, admin, and all of that, but that is not the, the goal of this, this talk. So the question is really, how do we get from some kind of starting idea to something that binds to a protein? Um, so you can start with the library, as I said, you could use something like fragment sets or a generative model. And um, what I'll be talking about are really fragment hits and, and generative models combined. So what are the two types of um, screening you can do? So I already hinted, uh, you can start with a large library and you can do something called high throughput screening. In this high throughput screening, you might identify a lead compound and then you're trying to optimize that lead compound. So this might look like something like this. So you have um, a protein binding site and you will find something that binds reasonably well, but it might not really um, exploit a pocket uh, interaction well. So you, you might want to uh, modify certain R groups in, in this um, hit you have to then get a, a lead compound that then might go down the, the drug optimization pipeline. Another approach is rather than trying to find something large that binds is actually look at, at fragments. So you have fragments that are drug-like um, that can bind into different parts of a pocket. Um, and then in the, the fragment itself is not really strong enough to, to act as a drug itself, but you, you now have identified favorable interactions with a pocket. And now the challenge is how can we combine these fragments to actually make uh, a good drug like candidate? So basically these are two different ways of, of thinking of the problem. And while we also do work in, in this area, what I'm talking today about is just um, fragment-based um, approaches. So in fragment-based design, typically, you have a fragment library, you would let that fragment library loose on, on your protein target you have identified and see where, where these fragments sticks, stick. And that way you can identify maybe a, a suitable druggable uh, binding site, but then the question is how do we actually make a drug from, from those, uh, or a drug-like compound from, from those fragments. So you typically want to do things like fragment growing, so you have a good hit as part of a pocket, but then you want to grow into another part of a, another pocket, uh, in, into another part of that pocket. You might have two hits. How can I link these together? Uh, you might have two hits that kind of lay on top of each other. How do I um, merge these 
in, in a sen sensible way. So these are the sort of typical tasks you would like to do. And there are algorithms out there that exist that can do that. Um, but the, the question we kind of wanted to ask is, well, how can we get from fragment to molecule? But how can we do that using things like generative um, models? And here the idea is, how can you do that using diffusion models? And the diffusion models you probably are most familiar with in terms of um, image generation. So think DALI, stable diffusion. Uh, you can say, hey, uh, can you generate me an astronaut riding um, um, a horse? And you'll get an image like this. So how can we use this technology but to do these kind of tasks of fragment growing, linking, and merging? So we didn't come up with a new um, target or anything um, in that regard. We actually kind of piggybacked on really great work done by the COVID Moonshot project. So that was a um, community driven project uh, that tried to or is still trying to to um, find a inhibitor for the main protease of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and as part of this, they actually generated a really nice large um, fragment screen um, at Diamond. So they, they used the XChem fragment library and screened it um, against this main protease target. And you can see how these different fragments, um, these are all like crystal structures, how these different fragments um, interact with the main protease. And in particular, you can see there's one pocket that has a lot of them stick to, which is this one, and this is the pocket we are interested in. So we have 74 total hits, 23 non-covalent ones. We're only interested in non-covalent hits um, in what we've been doing. And now the question is, can we take this data and actually generate molecules that are sensible with a tool based on um, generative diffusion models? So what is a generative diffusion model? Mm. As I said, these are ideas borrowed from um, image generation. So if you think of um, a drawing here, we just have the stick man. Uh, what we can now do is take this image and add iteratively random noise to this image until you basically end up with a, a image that just consists of, of white noise. And you can do this process many times. So you take different images of cats, dogs, um, bridges, whatever your favorite Capacha algorithm is trying to uh, get you to label at that point. And you can um, yeah, generate lots of noised up images. And then the neural network actually learns the reverse process. So it goes from how do I go from this noisy image to, to the original image uh, I gave it to. So this is this denoising process is, is basically um, used to, to generate new, new images. So we have an image library, we add noise, which is the diffusion process, and then we can draw a random sample of noise and use the reverse process where we've trained this neural network that tells us how we should reverse this process to get an image. So that means we end up with a model, and from this model, we can generate new, new data. So if I have trained a model on cat images, I can now sample lots and lots of new cats. So now we want to do the same thing, but with molecules. We're not interested in, in merging cats, but we're interested in merging molecules, these drug-like fragments. So in, instead, we can use an equivariant diffusion model for molecules. So equivariant here just means that we don't care about um, translations and rotations in the molecule, so no matter how it is arranged in space, it is still the same molecule. That kind of problem you don't have with images because, well, you have a rotation, I guess, of the image, but um, yeah, so that's what, what that means. And um, we've not generated a new um, diffusion model. We, we adapted um, a diffusion model by Hogeboom et al. that came out about two years ago now. Um, and this model basically is pre-trained and what allows it to do is sample a bunch of molecules. So similar to 
the, the diffusion model here that allows us to sample cats. This one allows us to sample molecules, which is great. But at this point, how do we actually get something that will look similar to our fragment? Or how does that relate back to actually taking two molecules and, and merging them to create something new or linking them or something like that? So how do we get the fragment information into our equivariant diffusion model? And this is where um, something called condition, uh, no, uh, conditioning of diffusion models basically comes in. So in, in fact, what we're looking at is something called latent variable refinement. Um, and it's a type of conditioning that is not happening in the training process. So um, if you think of, of this um, denoising diffusion model, you could say, I only want to train on cats, so I can condition by just giving it cats um, rather than all sorts of images. But that is a train uh, that is a conditioning that is happening during training. Instead, what we want to do is a conditioning that is post-training, so it can be basically applied to any um, diffusion model. And as I said, we again um, borrow ideas from image generation. So here the idea is that we do this so-called latent variable refinement where we have a reference image. And as we are denoising, as we're taking our sample um, of our new image, so we have a noise and we're, we're denoising it, we basically mixing in our reference image um, into that denoising process. And as we're doing this, as you can see here, uh, if we're adding Harrison Ford back in, depending on how much we're adding him back in, we are getting more or, or less Harrison Ford-like people um, in, in our um, new image generation. And this is the kind of idea we now want to do for molecules. So what, what does it actually mean or what, what happens here is, so we take a noisy sample um, in the image that is just white noise image, and then we're doing this iterative denoising process and if we project our, our vector into our latent space, so this is our neural network space, if you want to think of it in that way, we end up with um, our reference molecule that projects somewhere here, and our original molecule we're slowly denoising that is somewhere here. Um, if we don't use any iterative latent variable refinement, we just generate a sample that has nothing to do with our reference molecule. However, if we're doing this um, latent variable refinement, as we are denoising, we're basically forcing our generation process towards Harrison Ford, or in our case, towards our reference molecule uh, with um, the spectre called silver. This is what we, we call it, it's a silver rate that basically is the rate in which how much we push our random noise towards our reference molecule. So in the image process, that would be how much are we pushing our image generation towards Harrison Ford. Um, and that way we can now generate a final sample that looks a lot more like our initial sample and not just some random molecule. Okay, so that's the theory of, of silver, this selective uh, iterative latent variable refinement. Um, how does it work in practice? So the first thing I'm going to show you is a little movie. So we now have three fragments here. Um, and this is the diffusion denoising process you're showing, uh, we're showing here. So this is just a, a movie of, of this denoising process. And what you can see is at the end, you get something from these fragments that looks more like a molecule. OK, so we can use this, this seems to work, but now we actually want to actually put some numbers to this and understand how well it, it works. So here are two examples of, of samples. So basically I'm generating my cat, but instead I'm um, trying to merge these, these two molecules. So the reference is always the same as you can see. And then we are ranking, uh, rate, yeah, we're, we're increasing the silver rate. So the more, the higher the silver rate, the more we show the reference, the more we show of Harrison Ford uh, or of our two molecules here. 
at silver zero, we get some random sample. So that should not resemble the reference at all. The more we push this uh, rate, the more we get something that resembles the reference. This now allows us to, well, merge fragments. Uh, we can merge up to three fragments. We can link fragments. Um, so basically, by tuning the silver rate and showing our references, we can now sample molecules that resemble our reference and that fit into the binding site. So we might want to look at not just one, two, three samples, but lots of statistics. So here I'm now showing 1,000 samples uh, at silver rate zero all the way up to silver rate three. And we're looking at the root mean square deviation from the reference. At zero silver rate, we want that deviation to be high. So this is an angstrom, uh, and we expect that to be high. And the higher we push the silver rate, the closer um, the sample will be to the reference. The next thing we want to know is, well, if we are generating these samples, do they actually fit into the binding site? Because at the moment, we are not even including any information on the protein. But with the shape of the fragments, we know that they follow the binding site we're trying to target. So is that enough to, to generate samples, new molecules that fit into the binding site? And um, for this, we can look at a, a measure called open eye shape gauss. So that is basically a measure of how the shape of the molecule complements the shape of the protein of the protein pocket. Um, so you want a low score for this. And you can see as the silver rate um, increases, the shape gauss score uh, decreases. And we ended up having some issues at the higher rates. but we wouldn't want to use those high rates anyway. But uh, if we now look at samples um, at silver rate zero, we end up with clashes uh, in the protein because we have not given any information on the reference. So that is exactly on, on, the, yeah, on the reference and therefore the shape of the binding site. So this is kind of what we would expect. Uh, if we now do it for a higher silver rate, um, without even providing information of the protein, we can still um, trace the shape of the binding site just based on the fragments that fill up the binding site. So that, that is quite nice. Um, I guess the, the, the really true question that remains is how good or how useful are these compounds we're generating? Um, and this is kind of where it gets a little bit interesting. So if you look at this guy, you can kind of convince yourself that, OK, I have um, two reference fragments. Uh, we, we get this nice ring structure forming here. And this could well be a reasonable drug-like compound. Um, we do want to look at them these things visually, because some visual inspections will tell us quickly whether something is good or not. But we also want to look at uh, bulk statistics. And bulk statistics are things like atom stability. So um, that is defined as the number of atoms that have the right valence. Um, we want to look at something like drug likeness, um, where um, this DI is basically a bunch of desirable criteria you want in, in a drug-like compound. It could be things like Lipinski rule of five or um, other things you can think of. Um, and uh, another typical measure is synthetic accessibility. So here, this is image is taken from the original synthetic accessibility paper. Um, and you can see catalog molecules have a fairly low synthetic accessibility score. Natural products are a bit higher. Um, and the score is made up around things that involve ring complexity scores, stereochemistry complexity, and then things like a penalty for too many macrocycles, or if the molecule is too large, which will make it harder to make them in the lab. If we now look at how that relates to the silver rate, so you could see that for up to 0.5 um, times 10 to the minus 2, we, we get a fairly steady number of stable atoms and then 
then things start breaking down. But at this rate, we're already generating things that look a lot like the reference. Um, then for our drug likeness, we see that it's fairly stable. There's some variability at very high silver rate again. And then uh, for our uh, synthetic accessibility, it's basically the zero silver rate is as good as any of the ones we, we push high. Um, QED and open eye shape Gauss, this is quite promising. What isn't so great is the synthetic accessibility score. Um, if our typical products are like around three, eight is bad, but because also this zero silver rate is bad, it just tells us that the underlying generative model is probably not very good at generating compounds that are synthetically accessible. And to be fair, the kind of images I've shown to you, shown you up until now um, are somewhat curated. And often if you generate lots and lots of samples, you end up with molecules that do not necessarily look like realistic molecules or drug-like molecules. Um, and you even end up with fragmented molecules. So even if you're actually trying to merge fragments, you might end up with um, molecules that are actually two molecules. And the interesting thing here is um, the idea of, of this conditioning is not unique to this particular diffusion model we used. Uh, we used the diffusion model that was readily available with code um, when we started looking at this work. So it wasn't necessarily the best diffusion model out there and certainly isn't the best diffusion model out there now. Um, but it was more a proof of concept in terms of we can actually condition um, our model uh, post-training uh, using fragments. So what we have been working on now is improving this because we actually want to be able to generate molecules that are more reasonable. So we've been working on silver two. Um, we now have much better synthetic accessibility, something you would expect from more real drug-like molecules. And you can see the kind of samples you get look um, much more like actual molecules. The other thing, um, because some of the samples we generated were so bad that you couldn't even generate a docking score or some kind of score in terms of how likely it would actually bind to your, your protein binding site. We, we could only use the shape gas score in this new um, model. We can also look at docking scores and, and see how these docking scores vary across silver rate. And again, we still have um, a good low fit into the binding set. And um, the last thing that I think is quite cool with the new model is that about 68% of the valid molecules that are returned uh, will have uh, a query hit from Enamin Rail. So we could even just go and buy um, this molecule and test it in the lab if we wanted to, although probably we want to uh, perfect our docking and maybe even some other machine learn based affinity prediction um, methods first before we go and spend lots of money buying molecules that might not be the best in the world. Yeah, and with that, um, I'm already at the end of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, hopefully, I've given you a good idea of what a diffusion model is and how it can be used to generate new molecules that can fit into a protein binding site based on these crystal structure fragments. Um, it is important to look at samples as well as metrics um, because both will give you different information. Um, and we are now working on a newer version that uses a better underlying diffusion model uh, where you can generate much more reasonable samples that could actually lead to purchasable compounds that can be tested in there. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank uh, you for your attention. And I just wanted to highlight again that all of this work was done by Nicholas. Um, and this is the rest of my group on a very sunny day in Edinburgh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonia.
So our next speaker will be uh, Mathilde Gouilleux. So uh, um, Dr. Gouilleux obtained an um, engineer degree in chemistry in Strasbourg before joining AstraZeneca to make uh, a master project uh, in Sweden. She then joined the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics to make a PhD under the direct supervision of Dr. Ute Rurig, uh, where she worked actually on docking, uh, covalent docking, QMMM docking, and small molecule parameterization. And actually, uh, Mathilde is going to present to you um, uh, the two-step colon docking with attracting cavities, uh, a project that she did during her PhD. So thank you, Mathilde, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, so actually, my talk is a little bit more general than this. Uh, I'm going to describe a bit uh, all the steps that we have done during my PhD project. So not only focusing on the covalent docking, but uh, generally speaking, the small molecule docking with our docking code attracting cavities. And uh, so as Vincent said, it was under the supervision of uh, Uther Rurig and uh, Vincent Sweat himself. Um, so, uh, so the docking challenges that we may face are the following. So first, uh, yeah, for those who uh, are not familiar with docking, uh, docking algorithms are used to predict the best binding mode of a small molecule in a protein. Um, and basically, usually the docking algorithms are uh, functioning in two steps. First, you have the sampling of uh, ligand poses in the cavity, and then you score the poses according to uh, a score um, that they are attributed to. So. Uh, usually, you calculate the energy between the two, uh, and uh, and basically this gives you uh, the score. So um, the the docking algorithms they they face uh, these uh, several tra challenges. Um, so first of all, the ligand flexibility is very essential for sampling uh, various ligand uh, poses during the during the sampling procedure, but also. Um, the the flexibility uh, of the protein has a big importance um uh in the in the in the in the sampling uh, because proteins undergo conformation conformation changes which impacts the affinity with the ligands and also the scoring accuracy remains very important because uh, uh, the scoring functions of the docking code need to uh, model diverse ligands and uh, protein targets the solvent effect is also an important has also an important role because uh, solvent is very important in biology. And finally, you need to uh, find a, a good trade-off for using the computational resources while having uh, good results, especially when you want to simulate large systems, uh, which is the case when you have uh, large ligands or li large uh, proteins. Another uh, challenge that I didn't mention here, but is also a very um, hot topic now, is the modeling of uh, covalent drugs, because the scoring function is going to change if you have a covalent binding between the ligand and the protein. And uh, covalent ligands are of interest because uh, uh, they have uh, so basically they have been used a lot uh, in the last in the last years. And especially during uh, the pandemic, because um, many uh, SARS uh, many inhibitors of the main protease of SARS-CoV-2 were covalent. So basically, the advantages that they present is that they are able to uh, target shallow pockets and bind where uh, non-covalent drugs might fail. And also, it's possible to lower the dosage and the frequency of the treatments due to the potency of the covalent bond. So for all of these reasons, basically, we have worked on implementing a uh, covalent docking method in our uh, algorithm, attracting cavities. So first of all, we made an update of our code, attracting cavities, the AC um, abbreviation is for that. Um, so basically we worked on improving the, the ligand flexibility, but the, also the protein flexibility and uh, the, the robustness of the code. Uh, we developed also some um, some tools to generate the topology and the parameter files for ligands because addressing cavities is a force field based method. So I will briefly mention that, but uh, basically this resulted in a paper last year and uh, the update of SwissParam, which is a web server that is uh, freely available for anyone that wants to parameterize small molecule and obtain the, um, the parameters in the topology for running MD simulations with Charm or Gromax or do a docking. 
<clears throat> we also worked on the creation of a benchmark set for uh, developing our covariant docking method. So this resulted in a publicly available uh, data set. And then we worked on the implementation of the two-step covariant docking algorithm, which I will describe. And basically, uh, these two steps uh, resulted also in a paper last year. And finally, we uh, updated our Marine Bunion um, uh, collaborator of, of the group, uh, a PhD of the group, updated SwissDoc, which is also a web server uh, used for doing docking and um, is uh, hosting hydrogen cavities. Uh, and now, actually, uh, it's going to be soon uh, released. So first of all, the update of hydrogen cavities. Um, so the code works as the following. So first of all, you have uh, the location of the cavity where the ligand is going to be placed. And based on the surface of the protein, uh, the code is going to place some uh, attracting and electrostatic points, which are basically going to be used to sample the ligand in the, in the, in the system. Then you remove the protein atoms to remove the complicated energy contributions. And then the sampling of the ligand is going to be performed only in this mold of point that we have created. And this will be done by uh, rotating and uh, stretching the ligand uh, in the mold. So once we have generated these poses from the sampling, we need to score them. So the scoring is going to be based on the full uh, potential energy with the protein, uh, so the ligand-protein interactions. But when we reintroduce the protein to avoid the clashes between the two entities, we apply a soft core potential in order to reduce the clashes during this operation. And then finally, we perform a minimization uh, and a solvation of the ligand in the protein uh, based on all the poses we have generated before. And this consists in the scoring. Uh, just more in detail, the, the ligand uh, sampling consists in a stretching. Uh, so this is to um, not only play with the um, dihedral angles, but uh, to also have um, some um, some uh, movements in the in the ligand bonds. So basically, all the bonds are going to be stretched by applying a minimization with a charge 0 0.2 on each atoms. And then the ligand is going to be centered on each of the cloud points that we have generated, and uh, the rotation angle can be chosen by the um, by the user. So it can be one of these angles. I, I'm not going to go into the details here, but basically the, the sampling can also be tuned uh, from a high quality docking to a fast docking by changing the number of points that we have here in this uh, sampling procedure, so in the mold. Um, <clears throat> the soft core potential, uh, as I mentioned, it reduces the, clashing, the clashes between the protein and the ligand, and this is done by cutting the repressive van der Waals term beyond the th certain threshold. And finally, the scoring consists in first doing the full potential minimization of the system, which gives the total energy of the system, ETOT, and then uh, the implicit solvation is done with the fast analytical, analytical treatment of solvation, and this gives a solvation energy, and the score results in the sum of these two energies. So the new features of Atrogen Cavities 2.0 uh, are the following. So we implemented the possibility of using the CHARM36 force field, which is the newer uh, force field. We also um, accelerated a bit the, the code, now, as I said, the sampling can be tuned from having a high confidence docking, which takes more computational time, to a fast docking. Uh, the protein flexibility is possible now. It's also possible to uh, have uh, hemoproteins. And finally, it's possible to do uh, covalent docking. So in order to... Um, so we didn't train the scoring function. Uh, the scoring function is really just uh, an energy but we still wanted to uh, validate whether the improvements of attracting cavities were uh, how they would perform, basically, so how the new sampling would perform. And so to do that, we performed redocking. So basically what we do is that we take the experimental 3D structure of protein ligand, ligand complexes. Then we removed the ligand from the, from the protein, and then we randomized uh, the structure of the ligand to avoid the bias uh, during the, the docking. And then all of the structures that we have from our benchmark set that we had, and uh, uh, all the yeah, basically all the cases from the benchmark set are given uh, to the code at cavities. So basically the protein and the randomized ligand. 
and then the code is going to replace the ligand in the in the cavity um, and then we are able to compare what we had initially the experimental structure uh, as compared to the best uh, docking results which is here in cyan so uh, the idea is to do this redocking on uh, on several uh, data set on several uh, yeah complexes to a large data set and then define a success we define the success as having a root mean square distance below two angstroms, so between the heavy atoms. And then we uh, calculate the success rate as having the um, number of success over the number of complexes that we have uh, in, the, in the whole uh, benchmark set. So this, we um, use this approach to uh, test the code on uh, 285 complexes from the PDB bind core set. And uh, so basically we uh, tested several thresholds for the for the success rate. So we tested the best, um, if the best docking pose was below one angstroms, 1.5 or two angstroms as compared to the experimental binding mode. And we also uh, checked uh, how, um, how good is the docking code in giving at least one success. So one pose below two angstroms in all the poses that it has been uh, generating during the sampling. So here we have uh, the comparison of the randomized ligand and the native ligands for different um, uh, rotational angles. And this was done by doing a high confidence docking. So when we were using uh, basically a lot of points in the mold for doing the sampling. So here shows you a bit that, uh, so first of all, um, the rotational angle has an important role in the sampling because here you can see that if you use only 180, it doesn't go, it doesn't give very, a very good success rate, but of course it gives very, uh, fast computational time. So it's only uh, nine minutes, uh, of the of docking in average, in average, uh, when you use 90 degrees, you have much better uh, success rates already, uh, because we reach, uh, so for example, for two angstroms, we reach, uh, uh, almost 70%. So this was uh, this was a good um, balance uh, with the computational time and uh, and a good uh, success rate. Having a higher uh, a lower rotational angle of sixty gives much higher uh, computational time. So we thought that the best uh, trade off was uh, using ninety. Uh, so yeah. So basically, in that case, we reach uh, seventy uh, sixty nine percent. The success when we have the randomized ligand or the native ligand is only 9%, the success rate difference. So that was quite good. And the blind uh, docking success rate was 75%, uh, 70, 67%, sorry, which was good. But then, of course, you have a bigger computational time because it means that uh, you didn't define a box, a simulation box. So it looks all over the place of the protein where it's going to uh, place the ligand. And so just briefly, we compared with Autodoc Vina, which is quite used. And uh, we could see that um, so Vina works with an exhaustivity uh, sampling uh, parameter. So um, basically, um, a usual value would be to use 100. So when we when we compare uh, the different exhaustivity uh, parameters, we can see that it doesn't improve much the the docking. Uh, but also here we can see that um, the success rate is 57%. Uh, at maximum for 11 minutes. So this was uh, faster than what we obtained, but also the success rate difference between random and nat native is a bit higher and blind docking doesn't perform very well. And finally, so when we were doing fast docking with attracting cavities, so using less points for the, for the mold, uh, we reach 63% uh, uh, of success rate in 13 minutes. Um, and it's comparable to what we have uh, for Vina uh, in 11 minutes, but uh, which gives slightly uh, lower results. So that was good. But uh, so then we also worked uh, on the development of the force field topology and uh, parameters generation for these ligands. So um, basically in attracting cavities, uh, the, the equations of... Uh, the bonded potential are the equations of charms, which you can see here. So these equations can be used, for example, in uh, in MD simulations to um, to model the movements of the molecule. And so the total potential is uh, adding the these uh, bonded terms to the van der Waals and the electrostatic parameters, which are described by um, Lennard-Jones and uh, Coulomb potential. 
And all of this uh, can be obtained, uh, all of these uh, parameters and topologies can be obtained from SwissParam 2023. So basically you can just uh, enter the website, you can submit a molecule by giving a smiles or a MOLTU file if you have a MOLTU available. Uh, you can also draw a molecule with a sketcher and uh, then you can select the approach on uh, which type of force field you want to uh, to um, generate. So here I'm going to go into detail, but basically we use uh, for hydrogen cavities for small molecule, we use um, uh, MMFF like uh, force field, which uh, is uh, yeah is the, the approach that the group uh, uses. You can refer to the paper if you if you're curious. Um, and then you can just launch the parameterization, uh, and if you have any uh, queries, you can just use the links uh, that are uh, below in the website. So this is quite uh, straightforward. There are only uh, like three steps. And uh, if you want to perform covalent docking, um, SwissParam generates the pre and the post reactive topologies of the ligand. So basically, uh, covalent docking means that uh, the ligand can uh, is basically uh, first in a, in if it's an aldehyde it would be the aldehyde that is going to react with the protein and in the second step uh, it's going to be turned into an alcohol that forms the covalent bond with the with the protein. Uh, so basically the user only has to provide the ligand mole to file in one of the two forms. So this is something that. Uh, you can obtain from the databases, uh, most of the time probably in the pre-reactive form. Um, and then you need to also know what is the type of reaction that is going to occur in your system, which most of the time you know, because uh, you know already what the warhead is going to re what the, how the warhead is going to react. Uh, the ligand binding atom and then the protein uh, reactive residue uh, is also necessary. And then finally, SwissParam is going to uh, derive the corresponding topology. So if you provide the pre-reactive topology, it's going to generate the post-reactive topology and vice versa. Uh, so, in order to test our covalent docking approach, we uh, basically created a benchmark set for this covalent docking, uh, meaning that we took uh, protein ligand complexes which had reacted through a covalent uh, ch a chemical reaction. So we applied some quality filters from the structures from the protein data bank. Um, we uh, selected uh, X-ray structures with experimental data which of course uh, have only a covalent bond uh, with uh, quite recent structures, a good resolution and uh, diffraction precision index below 0 0.5 angstroms and a uh, Bay factor of the ligand below 100. So this was to make sure that the quality uh, of the atronic um, density and the structure generally speaking was uh, quite good. And we also selected ligands that were drug-like so basically, we use these uh, the following filters, so classical uh, Gauss filter and the uh, Lipinski rules. Uh, but also, we selected ligands that were not uh, having too many rotatable bonds and only certain elements uh, also for uh, force field uh, related uh, reasons. So we obtained uh, quite various benchmark sets, which uh, contained uh, ligands with uh, seven possible uh, different electrophilic warheads, going from ketones to uh, basically sulfur. We also had uh, beta lactam, and um, all of those ligands could react with uh, five different possible nucleophilic amino acids, uh, going from uh, cysteines to um, glutamic acid. Uh, and this basically, these uh, selection filters resulted in two different benchmark sets. So the first one was really applied on uh, structures from the protein data bank, which we selected uh, on the fly. Um, so since it corresponded to uh, the, um, the amino acids, the reactive amino acids of the protein, we called it um, a CSKDE95 because it contained 95 complexes. And we also decided to, uh, to have a wider data set. We also decided to apply our filters to an existing benchmark set of uh, 405 uh, structures, which were going from a previous um, study. Um, and basically, this resulted in the CS244 uh, benchmark set. So basically, we grouped these two benchmark sets, and we, we had uh, 304 structures on which we could test our uh, algorithm. So we quickly checked uh, the, the resolution, uh, the DPI, but also the EDI value for the ligand, which uh, is an additional quality 
assessment that you can use. Uh, so basically, this uh, last um, plot, we didn't use it to filter the complexes, but we used it as a quality assessment afterwards. Uh, so you can see that the distribution of the resolution is uh, is quite uh, it's quite uh, good. I, I mean, the median value is below two two uh, angstroms, so that was quite satisfying. Same for the DPI, we could see that uh, by excluding uh, DPI values above zero point five, we got uh, better um, better quality structures. And generally speaking, the legion the legion AGM value was uh, rather good because it should be above zero point eight. But we still had some outsiders that gave a bit of problems during the docking. And so um, briefly, the development of the two-step covalent docking uh, with atrogen cavities was done as the following. So it's, um, it's a method that is based on the two-step mechanism of covalent inhibition. So first you have the attraction of the ligand in the cavity, which is driven by the electrostatic and the van der Waals interactions. And then you have the formation of the covalent bond. So an enzyme reactive with, a, with an inhibitor would be, for example, uh, in, the, in the following forms. So the protein uh, has the, um, the cysteine protonated and uh, the, <clears throat> the ketone inhibitor uh, is in this form. And then in the, in the post-reactive topology, then you have the formation of the covalent bond and the inhibitor is uh, turned into an alcohol. Since uh, Swiss param is able to generate the two topologies for the ligands, you can basically uh, give uh, to, for example, if you want to perform a docking with Swiss doc, you can give uh, to Swiss doc the, the ligand um, in the two different forms, and then you give also the structure of the receptor. And then the tools are going to generate the complex uh, in the in the pre-reactive form and the post-reactive form, which is which is what we are going to use for the two-step covalent docking. So basically, the code is going to work as the following. So on the left side, you can see the non-covalent uh, docking, which I described in a short video. We do the sampling, the soft core minimization, and then the the scoring is the minimization and the solvation. And if we want to perform covalent docking, what we do is that we switch from the pre-reactive to the post-reactive topology of the complex before the scoring. So the sampling is performed on the pre-reactive topology of the complex, and then we switch um, to have into account this uh, energetic of the covalent bond during the scoring. And then we perform the minimization and the solvation exactly as uh, we do before. We also tested a third approach, which was basically uh, starting uh, the covalent docking from the post-reactive topology of the complex to uh, check how much it affects the docking results uh, to, to start from this uh, post-reactive topology. And basically, um, the comparison of these three different methods gave the following results. So here on this plot, you see uh, the success rates for the 304 complexes for the non-covalent Cov only method that I called. Um, so basically, when we start directly the sampling from the post-reactive topology of the complex, and with the switch method when we when we change the topologies. So you can see that when we don't consider at all the covalent bond, we have a misinformation uh, because uh, we have a benchmark set of covalent drugs. So um, it makes sense that we are lacking some information here. Um, the cov only better method performs uh, slightly better, and when we do the switch. Um, we can see that we have a higher success rate, even though the difference is not very high. Um, and this uh, is because we have more degrees of freedom uh, for the sampling of the of the ligand during the sam during the sampling procedure. Just briefly, we compared our our approach with the uh, Autodoc and Gold, and basically we could see that we performed uh, a bit better. So Gold gives already quite good success rates, uh, but we also saw that Autodoc was not so good uh, because the sampling of Autodoc was not um, so diverse. And so just a few words now on SwissDoc 2024. So we uh, we just got uh, accepted uh, for this paper. So we were very happy. So the new version of SwissDoc gives access to attracting cavities and Autodoc Vina. Uh, so you can basically just go to um, to the, the web server and there are multiple ways to submit ligands and targets. So you can just upload the mol2 file um, of the ligand and then submit the target. Uh, and then you have a very nice uh, 3D viewer to select the box center and uh, the box size, so you can even see where the box is going to be placed and so on. 
You have uh, the possibility to use uh, different docking parameters. So basically, this uh, number of rig is something that gives you access to uh, low value, gives you a fast docking, and high value gives you a quality docking. And also, all of these tools are accessible via a command line. So this is uh, very convenient to have programmatic access. You can also retain water molecules for preparation when you use the command line, which is not possible from the user interface. And you can use covalent docking from the command line as well. So basically, these are all the, um, the commands that you can use uh, from the command line. And uh, the visualization of the result is also very easy. You can also visualize all the, the um, uh, interactions that are in the system, and you can also check uh, the score of your poses, where they, how they have been clustered, and so on and so forth. So to conclude, just briefly, um, we, I think we developed a nice uh, and customizable uh, docking algorithm, which is uh, going to be freely accessible. So that's really cool. And uh, the sampling can be tuned with many parameters. So you can really choose to have a uh, very fast docking or uh, high confidence docking. And um, yeah, we, we saw also that blind docking uh, was, uh, was quite uh, efficient. So that's very convenient. The, um, the covalent benchmark set that we have developed during this um, all this study was uh, of quite high quality. So you, it's actually a freely accessible, so you can use it for your own studies. And uh, the covalent docking algorithm that we have developed was working quite well. And so, yeah, that was the, that was the conclusion uh, of this uh, study. So uh, the release of Swiss Doc 2024 is going to be soon. And uh, the other perspective that we have is to implement the QMMM docking method. So combining uh, quantum mechanics with molecular mechanics to perform uh, docking and to use uh, this approach on more intricate systems. Uh, we are aim at using it on covalent inhibitors, but also heme proteins. And finally, we hope that it's going to be used in uh, very um, 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 potent uh, drug design projects. And so with this, I would like to thank my group and more specifically Vincent and Ute for the supervision. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mathilde.